Hi, this is Michelle Nichols, and you're listening to TV Confidential. Aren't we all lucky? Ed Robertson welcoming you to TV Confidential, radio talk show about television. Gabrielle Stone will join us in our second hour. Gabrielle Stone, award-winning actress, director, and now author. Gabrielle's new book asks the question, what do you do when your life is falling apart and your heart has been ripped out and stepped on twice in two months? In Gabrielle's case, the answer included going on a wild adventure and doing a lot of soul-searching with the help of something Gabrielle calls the Thought Onion. We'll tell you what a Thought Onion is and what a very helpful tool it can be when Gabrielle Stone joins us in our second hour. We hope you'll stay tuned for that. In the meantime, we'll start off this hour by welcoming back our friend Mark Cushman. Mark Cushman, award-winning screenwriter, director, producer, documentary maker, and without question, the definitive chronicler of all things Star Trek, and Gene Roddenberry. Last time Mark was on, we talked about his biography of Gene Roddenberry that particularly focused on the career of the great bird of the early 1970s. Today, we are going to take a deep dive into the early career of Gene Roddenberry and the development of Star Trek itself. In the early 1980s, Mark Cushman obtained permission from both Gene Roddenberry and Robert H. Justman, Justman being one of the producers of the original Star Trek, to write the definitive history of Star Trek, the original series. Along the way, both Roddenberry and Justman provided Mark with access to the production files of the original Star Trek, the personal papers of Gene Roddenberry, and other documentation that had never been shared with the public. The end result is a three-volume series of books called These Are the Voyages, Star Trek, the original series, each of which not only provides you with a comprehensive biography slash history of each season of the original Star Trek, but take you back in time to the era in which the original series was made as much as any book possibly can. Volume 1 of These Are the Voyages, Star Trek, the original series was recently updated and expanded to include an additional 80 pages of information. Not only that, it is also available as an audiobook. We'll tell you about that and more in just a second. But first, we began our conversation by telling Mark one, one of the takeaways of Volume 1, and this kind of dovetails to something we talked about last time, is uh, this is more than just a biography or a reference book. It's a work of nonfiction, but it has all the elements of a narrative, all the storytelling techniques of a really good narrative. And there are moments uh, talking about Gene Roddenberry, and particularly the career of Roddenberry in the decade or so before Star Trek went into production, there are moments where I liked Gene and there are moments where I wanted to throttle Gene. And you don't get that kind of reaction reading a quote-unquote reference book. Not too often, but you do in your books. No, no. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard, uh, I've seen reviews where they refer to my books as a reference book, which I always cringe a bit because that makes it feel like it's just a book filled with information. And and what I did, as I said, using a kind of almost a screenplay approach, is uh, I, I put you there to witness the creation and the mm-hmm. making of Star Trek. And it's a very an emotional journey because they were fighting against so many obstacles to get this show done. Not just uh, the budget that the studio set or the, the censorship uh, issues with the network and uh, just a TV schedule of trying to do half a science fiction movie every six or seven days. It was just uh, such an undertaking. And it was exhausting. Uh, I mean, it was it was a, an elation for them on one hand and exhausting on the other hand. And you kind of go on that roller coaster ride with them where they're so excited about what they're doing and they know what they're doing is good and they know it's special and they know it's unique. But at the same time, you know, you're just dragging by the end of the season to try to, to get those last episodes delivered on time. So it's, I call it a biography of a TV series because I turn the television series into flesh and blood and and tell its story, its life, you know, from birth, growing up, and then dying. Uh, and the nice thing about this is Star Trek is resurrected, not in the first three books. The first three books, it, you see its death. But uh, in the books that I have out now, it's a two-book set on the 1970s, you see it resurrected and come back to life and come back stronger and bigger than it had ever been before. Uh, becoming a life entity of its own that's going to outlive 
its creators and everybody who made it. So, so yes, it's it. You can say it's a reference book in the fact that it's got the memos, it's got the budget information, it's got the air dates, everything else, the ratings for every episode. They're all in there. So there's plenty of reference type material, but it's laid out. I believe, and I've been told from everyone who's read it, that it's laid out in a way that it's an emotional journey, that you just go through the process of watching all these episodes made and aired and the reactions and the the lifespan of this series. These are the voyages Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek in the 1970s, Volume 1, covering the years uh, 1970 and 1975, which is Mark's latest book, which you just mentioned, that is also available through jacobsbrownmediagroup.com, amazon.com, wherever books are sold online, whereas volumes 1, 2, and 3 of these are the Voyages of Star Trek, the original series, also available through Jacobs Brown Media Group and Amazon. Uh, Volume 1 of these are the Voyages of Star Trek, the original series, revised and expanded to include another 80 pages with another 50 never-before-published photographs, plus new additional interviews, including some of the final thoughts and observations of Leonard Nimoy before he passed in 2015. These are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, available in hardcover, paperback, ebook, and Volume 1, now also available as an audiobook through Jacobs Brown Media Group. The audiobook of These are the Voyages, Volume 1, Mark, the audiobook is actually available as a DVD. Yeah, they're, they're putting it on a DVD because it's 28 hours long. And uh, so, you know, it would be, my God, it would be over 20 CDs. Okay. Uh, so they're putting the entire thing on one DVD disc. Okay. Uh, which can play in a computer, in a DVD player, but it can also play in a lot of the newer cars that have those players that are for both CDs and DVDs. Uh, and for people who don't have that, it's available as streaming audio which they can have right on their telephone. So that way, just about anybody or anybody can listen to it, depending on which they prefer. The nice thing about the DVD is, you know, it's got all the packaging, the artwork, and the cast list, and you get to see all that stuff. Uh, and I think there's like to have something tangible that they can hold on to. Well, just as your print books are changing the way film and TV reference books are being done. Mm-hmm. The audiobook of these are the voyages are also changing the way audiobooks are being made. Normally with an audiobook you have one single narrator, maybe sometimes two narrators reading right. the book as if they're a reader. This is more than that. This is more like a radio play. Absolutely. That's what I call it. I call it a, a, an audio play. Well, we're trying to go where no man has gone before. <laughs> and I'm not aware of anything like this. I mean, this has a cast of 80 people on it, which includes, you know, a lot of notable uh, Star Trek people and, and, and people from the original series, like uh, Dorothy Fontana, D.C. Fontana, reading her own memos and uh, reiterating her quotes from the book. And Adam Nimoy in there doing the job for his father, and Chris Duhan in there doing the job for his father. Chris, who, by the way, plays Scotty on Star Trek Continues, mm-hmm. so, and looks and sounds like his dad. Yes, he does. And, and, uh, and Ralph Sineski, who directed a lot of the episodes of Star Trek, some of the best ones, I think. Uh, you know, so they're, they're in there um, rephrasing their, their quotes, uh, reading their, their memos, all that stuff. And so it's really very entertaining. But, you know, the book is so big that Vic is reading all my words, and so you're still hearing a lot of Vic. Vic Mignogna, who is Captain Kirk on Star Trek Continues, you're still hearing a lot of him, because he's reading all my parts. But every time he says, and then Dorothy Fontana wrote, boom, here comes Dorothy's voice reading uh, that excerpt from her memo. So it's a lot of fun, and uh, Will's, it, but it was an ambitious project. It took a year to make this thing. So whether this is going to lead the way for other uh, audiobooks, that's yet to be seen because it all comes down to was it worth it from a financial point of view. Well, that is always the ultimate question, and time will tell on that. But in the meantime, before we leave the subject of These Are the Voyages, Volume 1, the audio book, you call it a radio play, even though Vic Mignogna is reading the bulk of your work as the narrator. You are involved in the audio book. Uh, you give voice to John D.F. Black. Right. Yeah, John was going to do it, but, you know, he fell ill, 
And so we waited and waited to see if he was going to be able to come out and do that. And it was, I was probably one of the last people to come in and do any recording. Uh, Mary Black called me and said that John just wasn't going to be able to do it. So Vic suggests I called Vic and said, you'll need to get somebody else. And he said, Mark, you do it. I mean, you interviewed him. You know him. You're friends with him. You guys have done a lot of appearances together. And you were there when he said all this stuff. Uh, to you as part of the interview so you know the inflection in his voice you know the passion that he had or if he was being a little sarcastic you would be able to recreate the intent behind his quotes better than anybody else so I uh, reluctantly went in because I I didn't want to be on the audiobook Mm -hmm. so I went in and did it and I got to tell you you know sitting there and reading those quotes it was as if um, uh, he had said everything to me the day before. It had been four or five months since I had interviewed him for that first book. Uh, but it all was fresh in my mind because it was so special to me to be sitting there with John, you know, and, and we did become friends after that, but that's when I first met him was for those interviews. You know, he's the guy who came up with the line space, the final frontier. <laughs> I'm in awe. I'm sitting there interviewing him. And so five years later, I'm, I'm recreating this interview on the audiobook, and in my mind's eye, I mean, John's sitting right there. It's as if we had had the conversation the day before. So I think I nailed it. Both These Are the Voyages, Volume 1, the print edition, and These Are the Voyages, Volume 1, the audiobook edition, are the only places where you will find out what the DF in John D.F. Black actually (laughs) means. We will not reveal that on the air because to find out what the DF actually means, you have to pick up a copy of these are the voyages, which is available in audiobook now. Uh, it's also available as an ebook, also available as a print edition through our friends at Jacobs Brown Media Group. A couple of things, and this touches on what you do with the book in general. In that, when you talk about, uh, even though you were reluctant to give voice to John D.F. Black for the audiobook. Because you spent so much time with him and talked to him and got to know him a bit as a person and how he spoke and his inflections, in a way, as a reader, that's one of the great things about These Are the Voyages is that you bring to life the personalities of all the people involved. You know, I'll tell you two things real quick about that. The second one will be totally on target with what your comment. The two things I brought into this, besides liking the show an awful lot. Uh, Star Trek was a show that made me want to become a uh, television writer and really kind of inspired me because not just because it was entertaining, but because of the themes and and the things that I was getting from it that I wasn't getting from other shows. But I, I used my background as a screenwriter to put the emotion into this thing, which I don't see in a lot of books of this type. You know, uh, other books may sample memos, not to the degree that I do, but they they may sample them and they have quotes from people they interview or archival interviews. But I don't really feel like I'm there. I feel feel like somebody's saying, you know, 40 years ago, so-and-so did this, and here's something they said about it, but you're not really taken back there. And what I use as a screenwriter is uh, the technique of you're there now. It's, it's not 50 years ago. It's happening right now in front of you, like if you were watching a movie about it. And, and so I use that technique. And with the, uh, the quotes, I, because I was a director for many years and, and still do now and then, I know how to talk to actors, and I know how to help them find their motivation and bring the emotion into the scene. And I'll give you a, a quick example about how I did that. Now, it's not in volume one. It's in volume three, season three. There's one book for each season. And there was an episode in season three called Alana Troyes, uh, which uh, the guest star was Franz Nuren. Franz Nuren, yes. Yeah, and uh, Bob Cope's wife at that time. And who worked, and with, the, Sh- and who worked with Shatner in the legend of The uh, World of Susie Wong. The World Wong. of Susie Wong. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, they had worked together a couple times, but yeah. Susie Wong was on Broadway for mm-hmm. a year. So they it was kind of a wonderful reunion for them. Well, anyway, I, I ran into the same obstacle that I would run into with a lot of the people I'd interview because you're asking them questions about something that happened 50 40, years 45 ago. years yeah. ago. It's like asking them what they had for breakfast that day. Yeah, yeah. And I think, <laughs> so can you tell me uh, something interesting about I'm making this episode, what happened, and oh, Mark, that was so long ago, I, I can just tell you it was great to see Bill again, and, and I thought they did a really good job, and uh, it was very professional, and you get your standard reply. Yeah. But then, see, I do my research before I interview them. I usually write the first draft of the book before I start interviewing mm-hmm. people, and so I know more about it than they do. 
and I, I looked at her and I said, Franz, did you know that the day you guys started filming that episode was the day that Robert Kennedy was assassinated? And she just wailed. I mean, I mean, there's this long wailing sigh came out of her as all the memories flooded back into her because he, she and Bob Cope knew Bobby Kennedy mm -hmm. and they were uh, supportive of him. And suddenly she just remembered being in the makeup chair and the AD coming in and saying, hey, did you just hear it's on the radio? She had been studying the script the night before and, and didn't have the radio on when she drove into the studio, so she didn't know he had been assassinated the previous night. And so she found out at that moment. And the minute this hit her, the entire production just came back with such clarity. Because I even said, so then you had to go on stage and you had to shoot this scene where Kirk is teaching you, your character, how to eat with utensils, and you throw a knife at him, and, and the whole bit. And she's remembering it, uh, as I was saying with John D.F. Black about recording his parts, she's remembering it as if it happened yesterday. And so I use that technique with the people I interview, is I do the research first, and then I'll sit there and I'll tell them something that happened right around that time. Uh, and if nothing big happened in the news, I'll just say, hey, that was the week uh, the Beatles' All You Need Is Love was number one in the radio. Anything, just to just to nudge their memory and go, oh, yeah, man, we were singing that on the set. <laughs> and suddenly, suddenly they're there. And so I use these techniques so that it takes the reader there. You're on the emotional journey with all the people who made the show. On the line with us is Mark Cushman. Mark's books on film and television include These Are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, an epic-length history-slash-biography of Star Trek, the original series that goes where no film or television reference book has gone before, transporting the readers back in time and behind the scenes in the making of the original Star Trek while also capturing the drama and emotions that percolated behind the scenes of all the players and personalities on the show. These are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 are all available in hardcover, paperback, and as an ebook through our friends at Jacobs Brown Media Group. Volume 1 of These Are the Voyages, also available as an audiobook through Jacobs Brown Media Group. It is narrated by Vic Mignana of, is it Star Trek Continues? It sure is. Star, Star Trek, Trek Continues. Perfect title because it it picks up where we left off at the end of the original series, about two-thirds of the way through the five-year voyage, and it takes you right up to the point to where the five-year mission is over. They've returned to Earth, and Kirk is promoted to Admiral, and everybody kind of goes off in their own directions, and that sets up Star Trek The Motion Picture because there never really been a link between the series and Star Trek the motion picture. Several years had passed between the two, but there was never a connecting link. So what Vic uh, and the gang wanted to do was, was take us from the, the last episode of the original series, Turnabout Intruder, and take us right up to the doorstep of Star Trek the motion picture. Vic Magnana uh, narrates volume one of These Are the Voyages, the audio book, uh, which will soon become available on a single DVD, because there's so much information to put on, on any CD, so it's going to be available on a DVD that you can play in your car or in any, your PC, your Mac, any a computer that will play a DVD disc. It will also be available in streaming form and also available so that you can hear it on your smartphone, uh, I understand correctly, which seems very appropriate right. considering that most smartphones are the original phasers from Star Trek. So it's, <laughs> it's all related, Mark, all available through our friends at Jacobs Brown Media Group, as well as Amazon.com, wherever books are sold online. Become an advertiser or underwriter of TV Confidential and let our brand help promote your brand. To find out more, go to televisionconfidential.com slash advertise. Hi, my name is Lily. My mom and dad used to fight about money all the time. Then one day, I heard them talking about this guy. Some uncle I never knew called Uncle Sam. Well, they say this Uncle Sam guy wanted them to pay him like a gazillion dollars. And they didn't have a gazillion dollars. So they called this company they heard on the radio called The Tax Doctor. And The Tax Doctor worked with Uncle Sam's people. I think they're called the IRS. And they're able to work it out so my mom and dad didn't have to pay Uncle Sam very much money at all. So now mom and dad are happy. And I'm happy too. Thanks, Tax Doctor. If you owe $10,000 or more to the IRS or state, call now and pay less. 800-649-0142. 
800-649-0142. That's 800-649-0142. Story Salon is Los Angeles' longest-running storytelling venue. We have live shows every Wednesday in Studio City, as well as solo shows, podcasts, CDs, and several books. Los Angeles Daily News calls Story Salon Gemstones of Narrative, something new, funny, astonishing. Sunset Magazine says, Tales tall, tragic, and tantalizing. All of this makes Story Salon one of the most eclectic entertainment experiences available. You can learn more about us by going to our Facebook page or by visiting our website at www.storysalon.com. Accredited by Guinness World Records, welcome to Archival Television Audio Incorporated. A peerless TV soundtrack archive preserving the audio from television's first three decades, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the golden and silver age of television. For more information, go to atvaudio.com. Ed Robertson, author friend Donna Allen Figueroa, who I understand has a new book out. Yes, it's entitled Fall Again Beginnings. It's the first part of a four-part contemporary romantic series a set against the background of working actors. Something that you know a, little, a thing or two well, about. Well, you write what you know, and I have been working in the business for several years. It is not necessarily autobiographical, but it's based on... Sure, many of the experiences that the actors in my book have, many have happened to me, many have happened to friends of mine. It's not if you're looking for... Valley of the Dolls, it's not, it's grounded in reality. It is grounded in reality, and it's the first in a series. Yes. Called the Fall Again series. Fall Again. Which is available as a paperback as well as an ebook and in Kindle at fallagainseries.com. Hi, this is Sally Reed Martin, and you're listening to TV Confidential. <laughs> Line with us is Mark Cushman. Mark's books on film and television include These Are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, an epic length history slash biography of Star Trek, the original series that goes where no film or television reference book has gone before, transporting the readers back in time and behind the scenes in the making of the original Star Trek while also capturing the drama and emotions that percolated behind the scenes of all the players and personalities on the show. These are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 are all available in hardcover, paperback, and as an e-book through our friends at Jacobs Brown Media Group. Volume 1 of These are the Voyages, also available as an audio book through Jacobs Brown Media Group. Going back to what we were saying about Gene and capturing both the good and the bad and bringing him to life as a person. Now, you had an advantage in that you knew Gene. You spent time with him. I mean, this is going back 30 years. But the beauty of what you do in your books and what I've tried to do in my last two books is when you do a deep dive into a person's personal papers, archives, production files, it can really give you a sense of who the people are behind the scenes and give you an understanding of what it was like to be there at the time. And if you can use that as a trigger to ask the kind of questions that'll bring the people to life, you'll end up with a book such as These Are the Voyages. Yeah, you know, and, and incidentally, you know, Gene was very candid. As, as uh, all, I've been very fortunate, the people I've interviewed, like Bob Cope, when I did the I Spy book and so on, and uh, I never interviewed Erwin Allen, but I had access to all of his private papers when I did the books on him and, and things of that nature. But I interviewed Gene uh, quite a bit for these books before he passed away, and then he gave me all of his memos, access to all of his memos, and we're talking 40 boxes mm-hmm. just for the original Star Trek series, uh, tens of thousands of documents, uh, memos on everything. You know, he'd write a memo on everything. And he'd be very candid. He'd write these memos late at night uh, on a dictaphone for his secretary to type up the next morning. So after 12 hours at the, at the studio, you know, he'd go home and pour himself a scotch on the rocks and light up a cigarette and turn on his dictaphone and start giving notes on the new script that just came in for uh, next week and on production issues and fighting with NBC. 
And so he's at the end of his day. He's tired and getting a little lubricated <laughs> anyway, yeah. with, with a little scotch. Uh, and so he's being very candid. And so you really get a sense of who he is from these memos. But he was also very candid with me in the interviews. I liked Gene a lot. I think he was a very nice person and an incredibly creative, imaginative person with a, with a true vision. But he was a person. And, and just like the characters he created on Star Trek, they had flaws. He had flaws. I mean, Kirk has flaws. He's a, a character you, who could lead a charge up a mountain, and you'll follow him, but then he's going to go into his cabin and confess to Dr. McCoy that uh, he's aching inside or the fact that he lost a man or what if he's wrong and puts everybody in danger unnecessarily and so forth. Well, Gene had been a combat pilot in World War II. He had been a, a Los Angeles police officer who rose to motorcycle cop, who rose to the rank of uh, sergeant. And Gene, you know, he... he um, he liked the ladies, and, and uh, he uh, liked to have a couple glasses of scotch, and he was a flesh-and-blood human being. Uh, and you see all those aspects of him. And I'm not shy about showing all those aspects, because I think, first of all, I'm showing you a real human being. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I, I think that the good so far outweighs the bad. That, that uh, you know, I mean, he really was an exceptional person. So much so that Rod Roddenberry, his son, uh, endorsed the books. Uh, Rod, matter of fact, Rod called me after he read the book, and he's interviewed in it as well, but he called me and said, I'm so glad you didn't treat my dad as a saint, because he was not a saint. He was a good guy, but he had his, he had his faults, and you, and you show that. You give us a true picture of who he is. Rod Roddenberry, one of the back cover blurbs of These of the Voyages, Volume 1, Rod Roddenberry, Gene's son, says this, meaning these are the voyages by Mark Cushman. This is going to be the Bible to Star Trek and how it was made. I'm going to keep it near and dear to me, says Rod Roddenberry, and utilize it throughout my life. That is high praise, Mark. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, he kinda, and he, he's, he's made true of that because he put out a DVD with CBS called, called the Roddenberry Vault, and in it is uh, footage from the original Star Trek series, numerous episodes that never got into the episodes, outtakes, unused uh, scenes, and so forth. He used my book to find all this stuff. They had the cans of film uh, in there, but they didn't have a road map. And with my books, uh, in each episode, I talk about the scenes that didn't get in, that the ones NBC said, nope, you got to take that out, uh, censorship issues and things of that nature. And so they kind of used that as a guide to finding and identifying uh, a lot of this footage that ended up in that DVD set uh, about the uh, of the lost scenes of Star Trek. These are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. These are the Voyages, Star Trek, the original series, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, all available in hardcover, paperback, and as e-books through jacobsbrownmediagroup.com, amazon.com, wherever books are sold online, Volume 1, of These Are the Voyages, Star Trek, the original series by Mark Cushman, also available as an audio book through Jacobs Brown Media. And as we mentioned earlier, it's more than just an audio book. It really is a radio play featuring uh, the voices of 80 actors and Star Trek personnel, as well as author Mark Cushman. It is narrated by Vic Mignogna of Star Trek continues. These are the Voyages, Star Trek, the original series, volume one, audiobook available through Jacobs Brown Media Group. Three takeaways, Mark. Three. These are my three takeaways from volume one of These are the Voyages. And okay. one, one of which, they're, they're going to be good. One of which we've kind of been talking about is in that you present a well-rounded person of Gene, good and bad. And one of the things that comes back throughout his personal arc, not only in your volumes on Star Trek, the original series, but in your volumes on Gene's career in the 70s, in that his ambition and desire to be noticed helped him and hurt him. That's a recurring theme throughout his career. Yes, he, uh, he had a lot of drive, you, you know, I mean, to become what he became, to succeed uh, as, as a, a combat pilot, as a police officer, as a, a writer in television, and then a producer in television, and a creator of TV shows, and, and so forth, and to keep those shows on track and, and go head-to-head -head against the network over 
all these issues, and they had issues with almost every episode, takes a very strong, dynamic personality, and that's what Gene was. He was a leader. You know, all of our leaders, you know, our, our best people are usually not our leaders uh, because it takes ambition and it takes ego to think that you can become president of the United States or a congressman or a senator or a general or, or anything else. So you have to have those elements in you. And, and he portrayed it very well in Star Trek with Kirk. And I'm thinking one episode in particular, The Enemy Within, written by Richard Matheson, is one of separated my favorites. as a transporter yeah, one of my favorite malfunction. Shows. Yeah. The good side, the bad side, mm-hmm. uh, the intellectual side, and the primal side. And, and the theme of that story was that the intellectual side of Kirk realizes he needs to take the primal side back into him mm-hmm. because he's losing his ability to, to command. He can't make any decisions because what if I make a decision that hurts somebody or gets somebody killed? So you kind of need that swaggering, animalistic, primal side to be able to be a strong leader. And so Gene kind of showed us that right there in an episode of Star Trek. And so that, that's the side of him. But, you know, if, if that wasn't who he was, we wouldn't have Star Trek because Irwin Allen was making a science fiction TV series during the same time, and Irwin directed the pilots for all of his series, Lost in Space, Voyage Bomb Sea, Time Tunnel, Land of the Giants, and they were all quite good. But through the course of the series, the network would change the series. They turned uh, Lost in Space from a serious, almost film noir science fiction version of Swiss Family, Robinson in Outer Space, and turned it into a sitcom. And Irwin's attitude was, you're the network, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I, I showed you what I want the show to be by the pilot I made. But you're asking for more monsters, you're asking for less logic, you're asking for more comedy, whatever it's going to be. You're the boss, I'll do it. Gene Roddenberry, nope, you're dealing with an ex-cop. You're de- dealing with an ex-combat pilot. You're dealing with a guy who's going to say, no, I'm not going to destroy my show for you. I'm not going to let you do that to my child. And he would fight tooth and nail. So that, that's why Star Trek's so good, is because of the two sides of his personality. On the line with us is Mark Cushman. Mark's books on film and television include These Are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, an epic-length history-slash-biography of Star Trek, the original series that goes where no film or television reference book has gone before, transporting the readers back in time and behind the scenes in the making of the original Star Trek while also capturing the drama and emotions that percolated behind the scenes of all the players and personalities on the show. These are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 are all available in hardcover, paperback, and as an e-book through our friends at Jacobs Brown Media Group. Volume 1 of These Are the Voyages, also available as an audio book through Jacobs Brown Media Group. One of the parts that made me sad reading the first part of These Are the Voyages, Volume 1, Mark, This goes back to the decade before uh, Star Trek went in development, when Gene quit the force, took the leap of faith, and decided, I am a writer. I am a writer. I'm a television writer. I'm going to take advantage of this new frontier and not only make my way through it, but leave my mark in it. And again, it goes back to his ambition and his desire and his recognition that this is a medium where you can make a difference because it's new and being developed. But one of the things I did not know until I read these, The Voyages, Volume 1, Mark, is that uh, one of the people who reached out to him early on was Earl Stanley Gardner. And right. that's, that is one of many examples. Uh, and again, going back to this is more than just a reference book. This is a little mini drama in documentary book form. Roddenberry's relationship with Earl Stanley Gardner is one example of Gene's tragic flaw, where his ambition got in the way and ultimately cost him that relationship. Right, right. Uh, When Gene was first becoming a producer, uh, now he had written over 100 TV scripts. He was like the top writer on Half Gun Will Travel and so many different series. Uh, But the next step up in television is to become a writer-producer. And so he got a contract with Screen Gems to produce pilots, and he did uh, several pilots for them. And one of them was... uh, it, it was a um, lawyer show, and Gene had been aware of a show that Earl Stanley uh, Gardner was doing, or a pilot that he was putting together, and the two of them had been friends. Uh, so uh, Gardner had given his material to Gene to get his opinion, and then Gene does his, and and the, 
it says, well, this is kind of like mine. You've borrowed from me. And Gene's saying, no, 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 this is an original idea I had. It's just, you know, happens to be like the one you're working on in some ways and so forth. So, so it kind of ended the friendship, and you see a kind of a battle of uh, letters between them there going back and forth over this. Y you know, it's that, that's where the ego comes in and, and so forth. But, but here's, here's the thing about Gene Roddenberry. You know, uh, I pitched to him. I pitched to him on Next Generation. I pitched, uh, matter of fact, uh, an episode they did called Sarek was a pitch that I did to him. I never knew Gene to steal. I never knew him to take. If he liked your idea, he would put you on assignment. And even if he had to completely rewrite your script, uh, even if, if most of the words in the script were yours, he would keep your name in the credits. He would not take away your, your credit, your residuals. He would not take your idea from you. And so I'm inclined to believe his side of that argument that you see in those letters between him and Earl Stanley Gardner. I, I think that Gene was not a thief by any means. He was an amazingly creative person. He didn't have to steal other people's ideas. He had ideas of his own. But what you do hear in there and what you picked up on and what made you feel a little sad was, was that he got kind of indignant. You know, it was like, how, you know, how dare you accuse me of stealing? You know, I don't need to steal your ideas. I have my own ideas. And so these two men who had been friends suddenly are rivals and the friendship is ended. Uh, well, that was the same side of Gene that would stand up against NBC, which mm -hmm. caused them to want to get the, the show off the network, despite decent ratings. And we've always heard that the ratings were bad, but you see the ratings reports in that book, and it's quite often winning its time slot. You know, yeah. So it, it, uh, it was a matter of uh, him butting heads with the network too much. And the, other, the writers who worked for Star Trek would get upset because he would rewrite them. Now, he wasn't a bull in a china shop, and I think you'll agree with this, Ed, because if you look at his letters and his memos to the other writers explaining why he rewrote them, you see him trying to be polite and explain why he's doing what he's doing. But at the end of the day, you know, he's going to do what he's going to do. It's his show. Well, a classic example of that is the backstory of Sitting on the Edge of Forever. Now... We could spend a half an hour just trying to break that down and only scratch the surface. But to underscore the point you just made, as pretty much everyone listening knows, Sitting on the Edge of Forever was written by Harlan Ellison. It was right. what, what I didn't know is that it was originally written by Ellison before Star Trek went into production. Right. And as Mark lays out in These Are the Voyages, Volume 1, it went through a number of changes, which... Ellison took exception to, but when you think about it from Gene's point of view, much had changed between the time Ellison originally wrote the first draft story and script and when Star Trek went into production, and the changes Gene made were done to be consistent with what Star Trek had become at that point, correct? Yeah. Now, when you say he wrote it before Star Trek went in production, just so uh, to clear it up for your uh, audience, uh, no, it was written for Star Trek but it was one of the first script assignments given out. Okay, thank you. So yeah. all yeah. they had at that point was the two pilot films. They hadn't started producing any episodes for the series yet when Harlan was writing that particular script. And so all those early scripts that were being written before they started filming or before the show started airing on the network where uh, writers could watch it every week and really get a sense of what it was they were writing about, they didn't have a lot to base their scripts on other than the pilots, and a lot had changed since the pilots. So Harlan wrote his script, which would have made a terrific Outer Limits, and he wrote a couple of those, too. But it, it didn't feel like Star Trek. The characters didn't feel uh, Kirk, Spock. They didn't really sound like Kirk and Spock or behave like Kirk and Spock. And so Gene Roddenberry, Gene Kuhn, and Dorothy Fontana, and Stephen Karabasis, uh, they all took turns rewriting that script to where by the time it was done and filmed, there's only a handful of lines of dialogue in the entire hour that came from Harlan Ellison's typewriter. The story came from his typewriter. It was his fantastic story, mm -hmm. but it had gotten a complete page one rewrite by the staff, and a lot of that was from Gene, and Harlan never forgave Gene. But, it, but I've compared the two scripts, and the first one would have been a great Outer Limits. It would not have been a Star Trek. Mark Cushman is on the line with us. Mark Cushman, author of These Are the Voyages, Volumes 1, 2, and three, an epic length history slash 
biography of Star Trek, the original series that truly goes where no book on film or television has ever gone before. Mark will be back next week for part two of our conversation of season one of Star Trek, the original series. We will talk some more about the acrimonious relationship between Gene Roddenberry and Harlan Ellison, as well as the early relationship between Roddenberry and Earl Stanley Gardner. We will also talk about some of the other ways in which Gene Roddenberry was ahead of his time, including an early version of The Love Boat that Roddenberry developed in the late 1950s. And last but not least, we will talk about the important role that Lucille Ball played in getting Star Trek on the air to begin with. That is all coming up next week on TV Confidential. In the meantime, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 of These are the Voyages, Star Trek, the original series, are available in hardcover and as e-books through Jacobs Brown Media Group. Volume 1 of These are the Voyages, Star Trek, the original series, is also available as an audiobook on DVD. For more information, jacobsbrownmediagroup.com. You can also find Mark's books, amazon.com, wherever books are sold online. We'll take a quick time out, then Greg Erbar will join us when we come back on TV Confidential. Are payday loans ruining your life? Do you want control over your money again? If you have two or more payday loan cash advances, listen closely. You may be eligible for a program payday loan companies don't want you to know about. A program that may help get aggressive and unfair payday loan companies out of your bank account and get you back on track to financial freedom. Payday loan companies may trap you into paying outrageously high interest rates. And they take way too much of your hard-earned money every week. We understand their tactics and know how to keep them off your back. We'll fight hard to help you regain control of your money. If you have two or more payday loan cash advances, call right now for a free consultation. 800-488-5880. 800-488-5880. 800-488-5880. That's 800-488-5880. Hi, this is Rhonda Shear, and you're staying up all night or day with TV Confidential. Buying or selling a home can be one of the most stressful things we'll ever do in life, but it doesn't have to be. And no one knows better than our friends at Front Porch Realty Group. Their community of realtors serving the Northern Bay Area of California that cares about their clients as individuals first and foremost. Whether you're a first-time buyer or looking to lease or sell your property in the Bay Area, Front Porch Realty Group will help you through this important transition by providing you with the right information for your situation while lessening the pain. They also work with a network of realtors throughout California who provide the same high caliber of customer service. Call Front Porch Realty Group at 415-886- 7411 for a realtor referral near you. You can also visit their website, frontporchrealtygroup.com, for more information on the services they provide, including upcoming workshops and seminars. For more information, call 415-886-7411 or visit frontporchrealtygroup.com. Front Porch Realty Group. They'll find the solution that works best for you. Uber is the mobile app that connects you with a driver for immediate transportation. Request a ride at the tap of a button and you have a driver curbside in minutes. You can choose to be driven in a black car, SUV, or you can choose UberX, the low-cost Uber for a ride in a hybrid or mid-range car. Payment is seamless and cashless. Build to your card on file with no need to tip. Enter the promo code TVCONFIDENTIAL after you download the app to receive a free first ride up to $20. For more information, go to get.uber.com forward slash go forward slash TV Confidential.